Hello and thanks for joining us this evening for the next in our live stream uh, interviews at Cornwall Film Festival, especially on this very sunny evening. Hello to everyone watching live and to those who are watching the recording. Uh, before we start, just let us know that you're out there watching and why not give us a like and tell us where you're from. If you haven't already, why not check out our previous interviews after you've watched this one, of course. I'm Henry from Cornwall Film Festival, and we're going to get started. Thanks again for joining us. So we'll check to make sure everyone's watching us. Oh, people are watching, people are tuning in and letting us know they're there. So I said, I'm Henry from Cornwall Film Festival. And before we begin, just a reminder that you can submit your questions for tonight's guest via the comments on this video. And a big thank you to Sally and the CFF team who are keeping an eye on that and all the other CFF social media this evening. If you don't have a question, but do want to tag someone who you think might be interested, do, or don't forget to share this video. So the more likes and the more comments we get, the more people get to see the video. Now, tonight I am joined by multi Emmy award winner, I think that's how I say it, who has, according to IMDb, at least 96 credits in the sound department, including The Jackal, Chicken Run, The Musketeer, The Four Feathers, Vampire Diary, The Phantom of the Opera, Mamma Mia, The Gruffalo, Les Miserables, World War Z, Sherlock Gnomes, Game of Thrones, I'm stop trying to rhyme them, Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, to name but 13 of them. Please give a big like to Mr. Tim Hands. Hello, Tim. Hi, how are you? Hope you enjoyed that introduction. Oh, very good. Hope it was all correct as well. I, was it? it was correct, and it, it, I, I sound ever so good. <laughs> well, that's how we like to do. We like to make everyone feel welcome here. Um, so, Tim, let's jump straight in for everyone watching uh, live and on recording. Who are you? What uh, do you do? Okay, I am um, an ADR and dialogue editor working in post-production sound. Uh, um, so the dialogue is taking the production sound recorded on location and cleaning that up and editing that, smoothing it out so that we can mix it. Uh, re sort of lots of things going on in there, like little bonks and clicks and people putting teacups down in the middle of words and you want clarity. There's a lot of noise and stuff that comes on with uh, production sound that you need to get rid of. Uh, generally try and keep that and where we can't keep it, um, we use ADR. And ADR is automated dialogue replacement. It's uh, a process. It's it, it essentially you uh, mark up on screen where a line begins uh, that you need an actor to re-record, where it goes out. And in the old days, in the old days, uh, we used to do it with loops. So there were actually loops of film uh, with a chinograph mark through it so that when you projected it, you could see the line coming across and the actor would get in the rhythm and it would just literally loop around and we would just record continuously. Uh, why it's called automated dialogue replacement is because now, well now, I mean, back in the 70s, they started introducing this where you actually could rock and roll as it were across a line. So you'd play it, wind back, play it, wind back. And as we've got into digital technology, it's actually instant. We don't wind back, we just hit and it goes jumps from a time code and runs the, the line. So the idea is the actor picks up the rhythm of the line and re-records. So my, my job is to make sure it's in sync uh, as best we can, that it's projected properly, that the nuances of the performance are protected. And in some cases we're adding lines as well. So we're, we might have cut a scene out and so something isn't quite clear. Uh, so we'll add a line on the back of someone's head to uh, explain what you just missed. Um, it's one of the fun things. You look out for those lines on the back of heads in films from now on. Um, I was going to be watching their films even more closely now <laughs> from that list I gave them. So you see what we can get away with. But essentially, yeah. Um, I mean, it seems the reason you would re-record is uh, let's let's take a you know medieval situation for example, and we've got a motorway next to us, and we've got lots of traffic and car horns, or you know you're a Victorian scene where modern human sounds are their tractors and almost certainly if you if you're shooting out in the country someone will arrive with a chainsaw the day you go to shoot so any lines that are recorded got chainsaw on we've got to re-record those we'll try and use things from other takes if they're applicable but 
often than not. So um, it is a case of getting the actor back in the studio and working with them directly. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a kind of interesting, uh, interesting approach. Yeah, we're going to delve into some particular projects a little bit later, but how did you find yourself working in, in this department? Is it a department? Is it an area? How is it described? It is a de- well, it is the post-production sound department. It's one branch of it. Um, the branch has been sound effects, uh, people call sound design, but I mean, it's just, you know, terms. Um, dialogue editing, which is inclusive of ADR. Uh, music editing, well, it's slightly a different branch, but included. Mixing sound and Foley, which is the replacement of all the movement in the film. So you add it to enhance uh, everything that everybody does from rubbing their shirt to picking up a teacup, putting it down to walking across the floor. Everything is re-recorded. And the reason you do that is because if you have foreign sales, you need to revoice everybody in French, German, Taiwan, Taiwanese, whatever it might be, uh, various Chinese languages anyway, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you won't have the production sound there anymore because obviously it's all recorded with English if we've done it here. So um, those, that, those are the various departments. Um, how I got into it, I, I left school and went to art school thinking I wanted to be an artist. Or actually, I had no idea what I wanted to be. But anyway, I did a, a foundation course in art and design, and then I went on and did a degree in fine art, still didn't know what I was going to do. Did an MA at film at the Royal College of Art, uh, still didn't know what I wanted to do. Ended up in the cutting rooms doing schools TV shows as an assistant picture editor. Uh, one of the lecturers, part-time lecturers I'd worked with, just said, why don't you come and work with me? You seem to be good in cutting rooms. I had the right mindset for it, I think he felt. Um, so I started with documentary editing on on actual film, uh, 16 millimeter film, and then into drama, uh, again for television, as an assistant picture editor, then edited some TV drama. Uh, Roughnecks was a, a series back in 1904, uh, which I did uh, editorial work on, and then um on into sound uh, the, the thing was there were more jobs in sound than there were in picture generally and uh so it meant i had more chance of getting hired uh that was the kind of mindset anyway so i i did dialogue editing because documentaries is essentially all about the production sound you didn't you didn't tend to in those days add very much in the way of sound effects so um, I kind of understood dialogue and I went into it. I had an interest in acting. And so I was quite good with actors when it came to re-recording stuff. And here we are 30 something years later with all those films under my belt. Well, it's always interesting to find out everyone's journey because everyone seems to come from different ways mm-hmm. into all these things, which is great. Hello to everyone who's watching. Uh, hello to uh, Cornwall College Acting Course who are doing a pro- some project What's been modeling sound later this September? So maybe we'll find out a bit about that later, actually. There are some Excellent. questions that will get to the all the root of everything. Uh, so what we're going to do now, everybody, is we're going to talk to Tim a bit about some of his projects that he has worked on, uh, some of which we mentioned. So, Tim, you've worked on pretty much every genre, every sort of style of, yeah. Yeah. I guess, film or TV show out there. And, you know, look at some of them. Some of them be musicals, uh, like Ben mm-hmm. Miserable and Mamma Mia. Yep. Obviously, then the action, the medieval, possibly chainsaw-based Game of Thrones. <laughs> yes. And animation and puppets with Chicken Run, Dark Crystal. So maybe if you could talk us through a bit about, uh, start with the musicals, maybe. How does that, how do you approach a musical ADR? Because I imagine there's a lot more work that goes into that. Yeah. Um the thing with musicals, um, I mean, I've done three, Phantom of the Opera, Mamma Mia and Les Mis, and they've all been different. Um, it, it, so Phantom was all pre-records, which they mimed to, uh, which then uh, we had to fit the singing into the, into the faces, as it were, because nobody's quite in sync when they're miming. Um, and then on Mamma Mia, it was a mix of both. Actually, some of the scenes were sung live and some were two pre-records. And then we had a lot of things where we did tuning and stuff. And that was mainly the music department, but um, there was a lot of, lot more dialogue in Mamma Mia than there was in Phantom, which is pretty much all singing. And then Les Mis was a completely different thing in that everything was sung live. Um, what they did is they were recorded the first take to a live piano. 
uh, or did several takes because there were multiple cameras. Um, everyone was mic'd up with little microphones, two here, one, one in case you sang too loud and this one broke. And the next one was just down here, about an inch lower. And they pointed sideways as well. So you can get popping on the P's and B's. Anyway, that, that was a process. And I was brought on to actually edit this, the, the, the live sound because they, as I said, they recorded to a live piano. Once they got a, a, a take they liked, that piano had been recorded live each time. And then you maybe get to take three and that's the one you want to use. Then every subsequent take for that scene, that piano was played back into the earpieces of the actors. So they always sang to the same piano once it, once it was locked down. Then we would edit the picture to those, uh, those tracks and then it would be orchestrated later. So everything was, it, it was a really quite a complicated process. Um, and we were editing singing. Uh, normally I don't do it because it's musical. Um, it's done by music department. But in this case, I was actually editing because everything was, was live. So it was production sound. It wasn't a pre-record. So we were doing all sorts of work on it and uh, making sure things were absolutely in sync. And in some places, like any film production, doesn't matter how good a job you do, we had to replace certain bits of the singing in an ADR studio. Uh, one of the, I, I see, <laughs> yeah, just some of the, uh, some of the stuff right at the front there with, with where they're hauling the ropes, for example, we had to re-record everybody hauling ropes, lots of things, that, uh, efforts and stuff, which we added in, all the people in the background, as well as the principal cast that were involved. So it's a huge undertaking. So that's musicals, uh, kind of different. What does an ADR studio actually look like then, Tim? What, what is um, it? What's the sort of space? Uh, it, it varies, but the standard the standard approach is 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 uh, uh, as you might imagine a recording studio with soundproof wall in you know sort of pads all over the place, a mixing desk, a big screen, a lectern, and a microphone. I mean, essentially that's it. In the states, they have it as a separate room, so you have a glass. Generally, it's like within an enclosed space, like a, a recording space, like a traditional music studio and an engineering space with a mixing desk. In the UK, we tend to not have that, this sort of glass partition. We are live in the room together. I find that a lot easier because if you want to talk to the actor, you don't have to use talk back. Um, so if you, you know, you, I'm standing next to them. I mean, I get up and talk to them. I mean, they're human beings. So, you know, you're there to do a job, they're there to do a job. So you kind of quickly get over the idea of being sort of uh, starstruck. Uh, oh, yes, I think uh, one of the first jobs I did was with Albert Finney and um, I was just but a, a mere strip of a lad and uh, you know it's quite something to work, walk into a studio with Albert Finney and you know just talk to him and uh, but yeah, I got over it very quickly except for Michelle Pfeiffer who winked at me once and that, that, that was hard. <laughs> stayed with you forever. It has <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay um, well, we, we better move on from that point before we get you know yes. there's comments about that one I think questions relating to it. Um, so we talk about musicals. Yeah. Uh, animation and puppetry. So obviously yeah. Chicken Run, Gruffalo, Shaun the Sheep. Is that right? I uh, I did some voice work on Shaun the Sheep. I'm actually the dog. You're the dogs. Oh, so you're a performer as well then. I did. So yeah, talk uh, us through something about the animate because there's no. I guess there's no actors like on it's screen. A, yeah, exactly. It's a it's a different thing. So um, so Ardman, the way they would work as a traditional sort of animated thing is you would have your script and you would bring an actor into a studio and record all the lines. I think Pixar do very much the same thing where you record it and then take the cut together. This is before I get involved. They cut together a sort of radio play with a sort of sketchbook sort of static shots of the images, black and white drawings, when they build up a sort of film thing. And then as the animations are made, they they map out the mouth moves. It's very complicated. I won't explain it here because it's a whole different department, but essentially all the mouth moves are done. Um, and then they have the animation, the little sort of mouths are moved around to, to do this. And then my job on that was then to fine tune the sync even further and make sure that everything was, you know, hard, mouth movements sort of so it actually looks in sync more so than it might you, you might imagine it's quite it's actually quite difficult and then we would re-record certain lines that things have been changed or add efforts and and other things in on top plus then we would get 
like we would with any film, any of the background things, uh, we, we've got what we call a loop group where we get a, a gang of actors in who play everybody else in the scene who isn't the principal character. So if you're in a pub uh, or, or in chicken run, for example, you're in a hen, you know, chicken coop, all the other chickens are all sort of wittering away in the background and getting excited. So I remember doing this, you know, years ago, we got nine women into a room who we tried it with fellas actually doing pantomime dame voices and it just didn't work <laughs> and it had to be women it, it was just one of those things so we had these nine women in there and they were all playing these northern chickens so they're all going oh, look at him, you know, oh, and all this sort of thing but all sort of cacophony of stuff in the background which then i had to i, I had to guide them on record them with and fit this stuff so that's what you would do with that then if we get into dark crystal it's a whole new thing again a dark crystal being puppetry, the puppeteers actually perform the lines live in the studio on set with through microphones and you know it was all recorded but it was such a noisy set and of course there's all the movement and there were wind machines blowing and things so most of that was not going to be used or couldn't be used but in addition to that they wanted to replace all of those voices for the most part with uh, a sort of Hollywood A-list actors and, and you know get get them in there. So we, we had to bring them into the studio, find a character voice with them, and then they would re-record -re to the mouth moves of the puppets. Uh, and each puppet had its own kind of weird thing so that the emperor actually had such a long beak that it, it kind of wobbled each time it spoke. So you didn't know whether it was articulating a bit of dialogue or whether it was just going boing. So they, we had this kind of strange thing going on with that. Uh, it, it took us about six months to record all 10,000 plus lines of, of dialogue wow. in, in the 10 episodes. So everything that you hear, every bit of dialogue you hear in Dark Crystal, for those of you who've seen it, if you haven't, you should, uh, was re-recorded in the studio with me and my team. Um, uh, well, the guys, Mike Wabro did absolutely heaps of it and was going actually stir crazy recording stuff. Uh, and I, I was in another studio recording as well. And then we were fitting all this stuff. And it, 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 it's so complicated, so complicated. I can't, I can't get into it in depth here, but it's just, it's a whole difference between production. It was re-recording a production sound, if you like. It was almost like going on location again and redoing everything. Uh, so completely different to animation and completely different to musicals and traditional drama yeah. it's just nothing i've ever done before Absolutely. sounds quite exciting at the same time so <laughs> anyone, anyone who hasn't checked it out it's uh dark crystal age of resistance which i believe is netflix so yes. you can head on over and watch that especially if you've seen the original dark crystal film it's really worth checking out so that brings us nicely onto something else that's quite fantastical and possibly made what you're best known for at this moment in time. There's obviously a lot more coming up that you never yeah. know what might happen. Yeah. Uh, do give us a like if you're watching or a like an interact if you've seen this TV series. So, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yes. Where you won? How many Emmys did you win for that one? Um, three. Three. So you won three Emmys for one of the biggest shows that was out there at the time. Yeah. Uh, with multiple, uh, I got multiple. Uh, pilots being filmed, I think, for current new series. Tell us how something like that big, uh, I guess, creating that world, what do you have to do on that? I'm imagining some chainsaws might be involved. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, yes, it's a medieval show. So any location with with modern noise characteristics, you know, motorways, even actually, I remember doing one scene with Gwendolyn Christie, with, which was recorded next to a river. A sort of small river but it was burbling away really loud through all the dialogue and you could sort of couldn't quite hear what she was saying so we had to re-record this entire scene it was a, it was a huge undertaking more than that though was in in if we take uh let's say i mean any of the battle sequences what i think a lot of people don't really understand is how much of the dialogue you're listening to in a mix Mix, final mix of a, of a show is actually re-recorded in the studio so if we take The Long Night which was episode 3 of season 8 which starts with Sam oh, yeah, spo spoiler alert spoiler alert yeah, spoiler if you haven't seen, alert, uh, spoilers. <laughs> if you haven't seen the show yet um, <laughs> keep watching but spoilers <laughs> so it starts with Samwell in a tunnel we have the Night King and his army of the dead approaching Winterfell 
Samuel's standing there, you know, uh, John is, is, is rubbing his hands and breathing. His, everything you hear from that point, virtually every single line of dialogue, whether it's principal cast, background characters, breathing, uh, any, anything you hear for almost 10 minutes solid is all recorded in the studio with me. Wow. Um, every cast member came and did it. And then when you get into the battle itself, um, everything you hear uh, vocally, everything, except for the zombies, which was a kind of an effects thing. I didn't do that. Um, but even they're recorded and, and treated voices. Everything we did, uh, every ouch, ooh, yeah, and ha ah, everything was re-recorded in the studio. In fact, my voice is in there quite a bit as well from various dying people. Um, <laughs> but the, the fun one was actually the, the, the Dothraki riding out. If you, anyone who's seen this, you haven't seen it, again, should do. The Dothraki cavalry riding out into the darkness with their flaming swords. And they're sort of doing this screaming thing and it's kind of <laughs> kind of thing. Well, that was us in a studio, there was me and 10 actors and we all did our various screaming things and then layered it up and layered it up and layered it up. And I, I was actually quite impressed myself when I heard the final version. And then as they ride out and they disappear into the darkness and the various lights go out, we kind of like took our voices out. So I'd go around and tap people on the shoulder to stop screaming and, and it would just sort of disappear into nothing. So all of that stuff and, and everything, virtually everything you hear from that point on um, also. Uh, so Maisie Williams in the library fighting the, the various zombies, uh, the whites there, she, all of that, all her efforts, all her breaths running through the corridors, everything else that happens there, it's all re-recorded. It was just so noisy on set. Wind machines and uh, various other items of you know that they used and it just wasn't possible to use a great deal of the production sound so there you go that's that's it so the yeah, game of thrones was epic on every level really um, it does sound it. it's that whole thing of there's a lot more that goes into it once the camera has stopped rolling oh yeah absolutely you know most of most of the stuff you're listening to you know when I mean, obviously you know you don't have a kind of cd recording of library recordings of dragons you know that's all created by paul well, you do now i'm guessing you must but, yeah <laughs> now you do yeah now there's some around um you know my, all that stuff is created in the atmospheres are sort of created from multiple sounds you know and it's um it, it's a it's an enormous undertaking Dark crystal, dark crystal is really a bounce back to that. Those, those, because it was a, a puppet show, nothing is there. There is no atmosphere. It's all done in a, in a studio. So all the sort of wind, the tweety birds, the various insect noises and everything has been created. Everything was created by the sound effects team. Uh, and, and us in, in the dialogue department. So you, you, there is nothing there for you to listen to on production. You know, it's, it's quite incredible the amount of work and the detail that goes into all mm. these shows. And it's, again, one of the reasons, I guess, why it's important for people to go and watch uh, films at the cinema or with a different sound system so they can actually pick up all those different layers that have been added to it. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you can't do that at the moment, but hopefully, as time goes back, we can get back out there again. And well, I'm, I'm currently doing a show called Brave New World, which um, I'm still on for another week or two. And we are now recording people. We can't take them in the studio. I mean, there are some allowances, but the, who we're working for for legal reasons they prefer people to stay at home and have like you know to stay with the lockdown so we're actually recording them at their own home uh with various uh, remote adr systems and uh i'm fitting all that stuff and sending it to the studio to be mixed it's really quite bizarre it's, every year brings a whole new kind of approach to what i do which um i hadn't imagined before but we're finding our way through this it's quite bizarre well, I think this is quite nice. We're getting closer and closer to the, uh, the questions from the public, so do keep okay. them going. Uh, some interesting ones for you, which I'm sure you might guess who they're from. Should I be worried? Uh, not quite. Not quite. You'll never be worried. Just, just, just go with it. Uh, but before we get there, you're talking about the way the systems are changing. Yes. And so I guess a lot of people watching, maybe uh, short filmmakers, or well, they've never done ADR, never, you know, it's sound often, including short films, be kind of an extra part, which gets yeah. left and left and left. Yeah. Uh, and all people who want to make a career in sound, ADR. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, so you've got any uh, advice, tips, suggestions of what, what people can do, how they can do it? Um, well, I mean, in, te 
if you're making short films and you need to re-record any dialogue, it, it, obviously there's a, a great expense involved in going to studios and doing it in a professional manner as we do with marking things up and streamers running across the screen and, you know, text. And you can, you can do it on a budget. Um, I mean, interestingly, you can do it on one of these now. Uh, you can buy, uh, where is it gone? There it is. There we have a little fluffy thing that plugs in there and we have an iPhone with a, a professional quality little shotgun mic. Uh, and there's actually now a, for those of you who don't know, there's a little program called Actors Mobile ADR, which you can download from the App Store and it will give you essentially a, a professional or, you know, a sense of a professional re-recording system very much like we would use but on a, on a phone and we're having to very often use that to get lines for actors who are not available they're in a trailer somewhere in the Mojave Desert and you can't get them into a studio so that's uh, one thing in terms of um, I mean it's a struggle right now because you know obviously you, you getting involved in filmmaking with everything shut down for the time being is quite tricky, but uh, I think the thing to do is start doing your research on thinking about if you want to get involved in post-production or production is that you start looking at what's available, do online courses, get on all the webinars. There's absolutely heaps of webinars going on. Um, back to the union itself, the film union is doing a huge amount. And in fact, there's one going on tonight with assistant sound and assistant picture editors talking about their work. Um, obviously, you're not listening to them because you're listening to me, but it will be available on their website um, or the uh, place called the Rough Assembly, which is another um, uh, uh, website that we use um, where you can get a lot of uh, information and just get involved and start talking to people and start looking at what's around. I mean, just don't sit and wait for it to come to you, go for it. You will get, you'll get stuck, things won't happen. It will feel slow. You'll think you've done everything you possibly can and maybe just run out of things and just feel a bit despondent. And then the phone will ring, it is the way it works. But try and if you are gonna get involved or try and get involved in, 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 in work, if you wanna get it as an occupation, Talk to people in person if you can. Don't send a CV in without support. It's one of the trickiest things. It's the easiest thing in the world to ignore a piece of paper. It's very much harder to ignore someone in person. Be polite. Always be polite. Respect people are busy. Maybe don't have time. Don't take it personally if they can't see you. Um, it, it is hard. But if you can get through the door, meet someone, it makes a heck of a difference. Um, then, you know, say, piece of paper doesn't yeah, mean no, a great deal definitely it makes a huge difference if you can get people to actually yeah uh, meet you and engage with them yeah and just to, to be polite as well whenever you're talking to people if you need to engage absolutely with them, absolutely be appreciative yeah. of their time like we're very appreciative that you're here today for example <laughs> and uh about to hopefully answer some relatively awkward questions which always makes <laughs> my job feel even so much better <laughs> we'll give it a shot we'll give it a shot so so then we've had some questions submitted from various people uh, both before and during Okay. Uh, but we'll start with uh, a nice easy one, I think. Um, what happens with all the Emmys? <laughs> Do I, what, mine or the Emmys in, in general? I guess, I guess yours, I, I imagine. Mine are, mine are, I, in typically British fashion, I'm slightly embarrassed about them. I mean, I'm quite proud of having got them. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, it, there's one or two people around the world who kind of have theirs dis displayed in sort of, you know, glass cabinets and don't touch it. Mine are on a shelf up on the landing of my house um, where I occasionally get a duster on them. I mean, they look great, but I would never have them in the front room when, when visitors come around. I, th I just don't know. I, I just think there's something very British about being kind of embarrassed, like kind of like pleased with it, but also slightly embarrassed about, you know, the people, oh, you know, oh, he's a bit ostentatious and you look at him, look what he's got there. I mean, I'm sure nobody does think that way, but it, it, anyway. They, they're on a shelf. And no, not on a shelf. Well, there you go. People, the, the trophy cabinet, you can just have a shelf. <laughs> and maybe don't, we won't tell the, um, the guys at the Emmys that that's the case. They might say, <laughs> no, the terms and conditions of receiving, you must display them from those. Display it and be with all our fanfare and stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay, so next one is uh, get him to tell the Julie Walters sliding down the banister story. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, Yes. Uh, 
so in Mamma Mia, that obviously everybody's doing their singing, and we we'd had people in to to re-record various lines and bits and pieces. Anyway, there was this. I can't even remember the song now. It was two thousand and eight. Um, so, but but Julie was sliding down a baluster in the middle of a song, and she sort of goes ow in the middle of this song, and um, we hadn't got her doing it, but she clearly was doing this on screen. So. Um, we we needed to sort of do it quite quickly and get something recorded. So uh, me and my colleague Laura recorded ourselves in a studio, being Julie doing this sliding down a Baxter, and then we put the two versions up in the mix to see you know what would work and um they picked mine. So I am Julie Walters sliding down a banister in Mamma Mia. <laughs> I feel like you should be specifically credited for that in the. Uh... <laughs> the credits there somehow. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm various people over the years, various people's voices. I feel like we need to update your uh, IMDb trivia there because I feel this could be some great little uh, pub quiz information. <laughs> Who plays? <laughs> <laughs> could be quite amusing. Right. Uh, ooh, okay. We're well, sticking on the Mamma Mia scene. Mm -hmm. uh, something uh, about sinking Amanda Seinfried singing yeah. on the beach. Y yes. This sounds like you may have had to do something ridiculous to make this happen. <laughs> um, well, all I remember, all I remember is a, a, a scene with with her on the. This is completely not the answer to this, but there was a scene with her singing on the beach, and uh, she, as she was sort of edging away towards Dominic Cooper, sort of on all fours, singing away, uh, I did get a question saying, D -d -d "Is she in sync?" Then I said, "I don't think anybody's looking at her mouth. I'm sorry, it's just." <laughs> But um, uh, yes, totally inappropriate, but true. Um, I don't. I, yeah, that, that 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 I don't actually know a great deal about how they did all that stuff on on, on the set. All, all I can tell you is about Mamma Mia. Just as a complete side note, is they had a huge party in which Benny Anderson played piano at a sort of big bar they'd booked for the night, and the the guy who ran the bar came over and said, "You know that guy playing the piano and singing, he's really good. He, you know, he could go far." completely unaware that it was Benny Anderson from ABBA, but yeah, there you go. There's, there's some Mamma Mia. Some of the best things, though, isn't it? It's like, oh, actually, that guy's rather good. Like, yes, yes, they are. They're, they're okay. Oh, but as, as a matter of fact, Anna, Amanda Seyfried is possibly one of the, amongst the finest people doing ADR that I ever worked with. She did an entire scene in one take. She wow. watched it two or three times. It was about 12 to 15 lines of dialogue all spaced out and she watched herself several times and then she said okay I'm ready to record and she did it and it was perfect sync from start to finish I barely had to touch anything I'd never had that from anyone before uh she just did it in fact I got her to do it again because I couldn't believe she'd done it right first time but she was absolutely superb at it I don't know if she's still as good uh but she was unbelievable oh, and very nice Oh, that's, that's good to hear. I mean, that's quite always nice in these sort of programs where you see everyone, especially singing, I suppose. Okay, uh, so does working on an animation project present any different challenges? I know we covered a little bit of that, but anything else specific? Uh, what, yeah, what, well, sight is it's a not a particularly interesting thing, I suppose, but because everything's recorded wild what we call wild track recordings, they just roll and roll and roll. So if we want to find a sort of reaction, like a ooh or a ooh kind of sound, they're in amongst all these recordings. So we have to go through and find them all and literally put them in little folders of reactions. And it, it's incredibly time consuming. And you would be amazed at how the, the sort of mouth movement requires a particular sound. And you can't just put any sound on it and it will work. So a, a particular ooh might not be, you might have a range of oohs and only one of them is going to work. Um, this is why we end up sometimes just re-recording things because it's just uh, um, it's just exhausting searching through these things. But we did loads in Early Man that way, uh, where we just had just collections of, you know, you'd have an actor in the studio going, oh, oh, ah, ah, mm, mm, ah. Oh, and you just like that for, for about 20 minutes and I hope you've got it. And I bet your bottom dollar that there'll be at least one mouth movement that none of those will work with. 
to keep acting for each individual. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one. It's just impossible. So again, it's a lot of work getting these everything to sync up these mouth movements. It's yeah, not as simple yeah. as it looks. No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing is that of animation, I suppose, what, what's different with production sound, well, re replacing production sound, we'll use two microphones. We have the, a, a rifle mic, which we would equivalent to what we use on set, plus a little clip mic, a little, a little a level here, um, which the radio mic, some people call it, and it, it's, we'll put it somewhere on the chest here. And the idea is to try and match the two things in with the sound that you've got from so you could go with this mic or that mic or actually a combination of the two with animation it's all done on a big fat um uh, yeah i can't get it hang on a minute let me show you uh, or if you can see that it's one of these mics a condenser mic and i don't know it, it, we've done it with rifle mics and things that um like we would on production it just doesn't sound right you need a big fat sort of full-bodied recording to make animation work and another weird thing about animation is it, it, it just for those of you who are into sound um is that with product traditional drama feature films it's very rare that you pan a voice left or right or across the screen someone in the background maybe but principal dialogue you might have someone here and someone there and talking to each other but you don't have the voice coming from there and there it comes out the middle and if you do put it left and right, it really throws you. It makes you feel a bit seasick. With animation, we do. We do do that. And I don't know, that it's sort of something about that animation will take that panning. And I think it's maybe just a whole process that we've grown up with. We accept that voices from cartoon characters can come from there and there, but not on, on sound, uh, not on uh, the drama sound. It just doesn't work. No, no, makes, make, I'm, make I'm sure that... I am sure there are exceptions to that rule. They usually are, but it's very rare that we, we, we will pan a voice. Maybe someone walking off, but not actually a conversation. It's mm -hmm. all straight out the center speaker. That's good. That goes a lot of particularly shorter films, obviously, are stereo rather than a full yes. mix. But... Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, do you coach rugby? I do coach rugby. Wow. I've got a question from uh, Caroline Miller here. Oh, <laughs> hello, Caroline. <laughs> Uh, the rugby team is, you know, is honoured to have you as their coach, by the way. That is now out in the public domain. Uh, but she is asking, what has been your favourite project you've done so far? Um, it's, it's sort of changed, I guess, over, over time. Um, there was a film I did. Could be Chicken Run was, was great, exciting, really enjoyed doing that one. Uh, it was killer hard, but uh, that was one that I always looked back and thought was great. Uh, Elizabeth was another one that I really liked. Life and Death of Peter Sellers, which was a film I did for HBO. I, I was offered the job on Harry Potter 3, I think it was, and I turned it down to do The Life and Death of Peter Sellers because I just loved the script, um, love what I was watch watching with that. That was my favourite for a good many years. That was 2005. But I think, I suppose just in terms of workload and and satisfaction game of thrones probably did it because there was i was so involved most of the films i've worked on i'm working with the director and the actor so we were in the studio together and my contribution can vary depending on how hands-on a director wants to be what they want my contribution to be um, most are just fine with me stepping in on performance notes where necessary with Game of Thrones, it was just me and the actors and uh, Ida, our, our associate producer. So the two of us would sit with the engineer mixing the sound um, recording for us and I would direct the actors. And that, that right from the pilot, that's what I did. And um, I really enjoyed doing that. It was great fun. Uh, and, you know, eight seasons of it. So over about the process of a period of 10 years, uh, I got to do that and I don't know if I'll ever get quite the freedom that I had on that show on anything else ever again it was just quite extraordinary so probably Game of Thrones Game of Thrones fair that's, I think that's an understandable you know understandable thing to choose yeah. uh, Samuel is asking are you able to enjoy films without automatically critiquing the sound <laughs> that's a good question and the answer is yes except where it's been badly done <laughs> If I, I mean, for example, and it, if I, and it does happen, and there are numerous reasons why it might happen, but if, if there is re-recorded dialogue and I can spot it, 
that's it. It's curtains. I, 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 I really struggle there. Uh, but a good, good film. Um, you know, if it, like anything, if it, if the story's going, if it's touching you, if it's make, you know, if, if it's, if you kind of ignore all that. Even if it hasn't got a sort of hugely fabulous soundtrack, you still go with it. Um, I, I think, yes, yeah, something's done badly. Yeah, I'll notice. I, it's a little bit of a struggle now because sometimes with digital broadcasts, you know, things are slightly out of sync. You know, we go to all that trouble of putting the damn thing in sync, and then someone sticks it on, on a, on a, you know over the internet and you, you you end up with it kind of like something two frames late it's it's really frustrating but um generally i you know i'm all right with it i can i can i can cope that's that's me you don't you don't get to enjoy some things out there that you haven't worked on <laughs> yeah but we've got a question from cornwall college here so yeah let me actually have a read of this as we go uh so it looks like they've got this project coming up later this year how can we enhance the sound of our zombie mutant actor voices in our annual horror, horror walk performance to make them seem like there are more of them? <laughs> wow. So they want to make, I guess, turn 10 zombies into 100 zombies. Uh, layering up is, is the thing, is, is, is to record lots of stuff and just have tracks and tracks and tracks of it, wow. but also to have some of it move around as well look if you record in stereo one of the things that i found with what we call the group loop group recording which i changed changed the way i worked on game of thrones is i stopped worrying about things being on mic or off mic it's just about the feel of it so for a lot of those battle sequences uh which which would tie into what you're trying to do is we just have people moving across the mic like this so things could come on the mic and off the mic and just we record track after track after track. And if you layer them on top, it just sounds like hundreds of people, the same 10 voices. We only ever had 10 voices in the studio. Well, 11 with me, but you know, it always, if you listen to any of those battle sequences, like the battle of the bastards or the, or the long night, or even, you know, further back in season two, you know, um, that's only, I mean, there, there are sort of battle sounds in the effects, but it's much more distance, but the upfront stuff, everything you see and all the people rushing around and all the individual shouts and all that's recorded in the studio. It's just layered up lots and lots of t recordings and movement is the thing. Uh, don't just, do you think that, is there any sort of software suggest they could edit it weird? Is anything particularly we, easy or well, accessible? Uh, we all now, I think professionally use Pro Tools, uh, which it's very difficult for me to think of other systems now because I've been using it so long. Um, there are there are other audio editing software that you can get, but but it but in terms of, I think you can get a sort of a, a sort of lower budget version of Pro Tools, which is still have enough tracks on it for you to do the kind of thing you want to do. It's probably better to use it in the sense that if you are going to go into doing things professionally, you might as well use the kit that we're going to use rather than try and have to adapt again. To, from what you have been doing um but yeah lay layers is the thing it, it's not just record 10 people and hope it's going to do you need to record 10 people 10 times 20 times and get them to do different things each time and then layer it all up so you've got multiple tracks it's just okay, like if, if you if anyone's into music you're recording guitars if you listen to a, a rock a rock track it's not one guitar playing They'll have five times the guitars playing, you know, different parts, but all layered on top of each other. So it sounds huge. It's not one guitar. Um, so it's the same approach, really. It's, it's cool. So anyone looking to do like multiple things, it's going to be layers. Yeah. Don't be afraid to be off mic and probably Pro Tools is the way forward with, uh, with your software. But for, for me, yeah, I would say that's probably the best thing to do. Well, that's, that's, don't be afraid. I mean, a lot of the things, like, I came from a fine art background. And the one thing I found is that I work with a lot of people who come from a technical background. And technical people like to do things technically correct. I'm an art school student. I don't do things technically correct. I, I just, it just does my head in, the kind of worrying about things being specific on mic. It, it, look, just play with it. it. If it sounds right, it is right. That's, that's the thing. It's like, you know, yes, do, you know, does the needle hit this and does it actually do always a little bit of distortion. You can go around, around in circles of that and drive yourself nuts thinking you've got to go to certain tolerances just have fun with it you know it's noise just make a noise 
I think that's it. Just everyone get out there, let's make, some, let's make noises, enjoy yeah. it, and then use yeah. it as a creative expression as well for yeah. whatever you're doing, whatever project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and onto that, I did in projects. What is your favorite genre to work in and why? <laughs> uh, I honestly don't think I. I don't think I have a favorite. If I, if I, let me let me put it this way: the thing that I always really wanted to do was work on a science fiction movie, and I never have. So many That's producers are watching song. or directors. They, right. I always wanted to do something, you know, some something involving spaceships. I don't know why, but I always really did. Um, and it's never happened. I can't think of one science fiction show that I've worked on. Well, mm, maybe a couple of Dennis Potter things very early on, uh, which were sort of futuristic. I suppose they were science fiction. Um, but nothing, not, not spaceships, you know. That's, that's what I wanted to do, and it's not happened. So that's yeah, the kind of thing I, I, I'm hoping that when I do do it, <laughs> that that's the thing I enjoyed the most. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks to Dave for that question then. Uh, I think so spaceships, spaceships are the way forward. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ah, so look at this one. This is from Samuel. As a dialogue editor and ADR supervisor, do you prefer to rescue the production dialogue or re-record the voice performances in ADR? Uh, okay, good question. Yeah, uh, if I can retain, if I can repair it, I will do it. Um, one of the problems with that is generally time, is that we, we're always up against a, a deadline. So um, to actually salvage some recordings can be done. I've done it on, on some films, you know, things that seem like they would be on repair, have done it, but it takes time and usually we're, we're pressured. So yes, I, I'm very proud of salvaging things where I can, I think that's great, but I put equal value on, on recording something so well and editing that fitting that so well getting the right performance getting it in sync so that you don't know that if, if you can tell that it's been re-recorded I, I, i've done things where I've, I've shown people things and they said oh well, yeah it's been re-recorded yeah but if you know but if you don't know and i think of a vast majority of people out there watching probably don't know I've seen some films I've worked on where I did do ADR recorded stuff and I can't tell years later. I, I know I did it, but I can't tell anyone. You know, I go, did I record that? I don't know. If it's done well, you shouldn't be able to tell. I think if you've got a, a sort of big action sequence, you look, like I said, with the battles, you know, most of that dialogue has been re-recorded. Therefore it kind of, you know, but if you've got a, a, a scene in a sort of like in a, in a, in a lounge in, or, you know, a dining room in say, you know, a, a stately home, and you've re-recorded three lines in there somewhere, but you don't know, and you can't tell. That's really good. That's really good when you get that right. Mm, so there you go. So basically, you know, both options really both are on options. the table. Both options are good, yeah. But on the topic of time, we are coming towards the end now, Tim. <laughs> I know, and so thank you for your time. Um, a final question for you though, mm -hmm. kind of a, a little bit of an odd one now, um, but what are you going to do? Uh, when the, the lockdown is fully lifted? What's the first thing you're going to do? Um, in all honesty, I am actually still working. Uh, I'm likely to finish soon. I don't. The next job I had was going to be August. That's now probably October. So the first thing I'm going to do when lockdown lifts is everyone else will go back to work and I'll be up a ladder with a paintbrush doing DIY because I won't have any jobs. Because... All those, all those productions have got to go out and film before I can get involved. And yeah. since they've all been delayed, then and, you know the things that were nearly finished, we've been finishing. So things that weren't finished filming, they're all delayed. So we're going to have a bit of a hole. Um, some of us, not everybody. No, well, there'll be a, a bit few of, months. Bit of break so for you. I think I think I've been working solidly since last November, except for a week off at Christmas. So to be honest with you, I'd say I'd like to put my feet up, but I'm going to be painting. I just know it. <laughs> Well, thank you for taking the time out of the busy schedule to join us today, then, Tim. Uh, so, if everyone, thanks for joining us as well. If you want to give us a uh, give us a like to say thank you for Tim on the video, that'd be wonderful. Uh, we are back same time next week for another live interview uh, with military advisor for TV and film Paul Bidas, who's worked on such projects as Peterloo, Strike Back, and 1917. So that's next Wednesday at 6 p.m. again. 
We've also got two masterclasses going at the moment, one with Molly Emma Rowe about costume design and one with executive producer Ted Oakes about how to develop and sell your ideas for broadcast TV. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you again, Tim, for your time. It's been really interesting. If you're watching the recording, please do let us know where you're watching from. And uh, if any other questions do submit, then we're going to try and get Tim down at some point to sunny Cornwall in right. the near future. Hopefully he'll agree. He never spring these things on people. But have a lovely week, everybody. And thank you again.